Hi and welcome back to Garden Ninja for the February garden tour. Now it's been a really cold and difficult winter but today's video guide is going to give you a tour around my garden here at Garden Ninja HQ and I'm going to be giving you loads of top tips for things you can be doing in your garden in February before the spring arrives. We're going to be talking about planting trees, dealing with storm damage and also tidying up your herbaceous perennials and other plants. So come on, let's get cracking. If you've not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, hit the red button to subscribe today. Also click the bell for notifications. We'll have access to hundreds of garden design, hints, tips and hacks from me, the Garden Ninja. And best of all, it's free. Now February is also the ideal time to get your roses into tip-top shape. So if you've not already pruned them, make sure you get out this weekend or next weekend and make a start. If you need to know more, I've got a really detailed guide on how to prune roses. But behind me is an example of a climbing rose and I've pruned it this week and I'm going to just show you a close-up of how I've arranged the stem structure. So with a climbing rose, you want to take that vertical growth and coerce it gently and take it horizontally. And what that will do is then send off shoots that are then going to go upwards and create flowers. If you let it all grow up towards the gods, you're going to end up with just a few flowers on the top and not much else. So let's take a closer look now. If you can see those green stems there, my climbing rose, you'll notice that I have tied them in horizontally. They would have grown vertically, but I've moved them horizontally. And you can see that there if I move back. And what that will do is will enable the rose to send off all these buds here, 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 upwards, and they will flower. If I'd just left it to grow vertically, I'd get a few flowers at the top, but nothing else. So it's really important to train your climbing roses horizontally and even cut out growth that isn't going in the right direction. So it's better to have a few really good horizontals than loads of scrabbly growth growing up everywhere, because this will give you a much better flowering season. Now with the recent storms, we've had a bit of bad news in that one of my favourite trees, the multi-stem evergreen oak, has toppled and it's been here about 25 years now. Um, it can't really be revived, the root structure's too damaged, so we're going to have to dig it out, cut it up and then obviously use it for either firewood or for a book hotel. But I've got a solution and I'm going to show you now what I'm going to put in its place. So with a bit of help, I've removed the evergreen oak and I looked at the root structure once it had fallen over. Most of the large roots had snapped and it looked like it was in a really bad way. So rather than trying to resurrect it and having to stake it, which would be a safety issue because it might blow over again, I decided to remove it. So we've got this bare patch behind me and I'm going to show you a tree in a minute that's going to replace the evergreen oak, albeit a little bit smaller. So take a look down here. Now, as I said, it's a bit smaller than the evergreen oak that had fallen over, but this is a wonderful, weird fruit tree. And it's known as a medlar. And this is medlar Nottingham. So Nottingham is the species and medlar is the genus. Now, they're a really unusual fruit tree because not many of them tend to exist. I very rarely see them on my travels. I don't really see them in people's gardens. And I'm not sure why, because these are an absolutely incredible tree. Now, if you've followed my vlogs before, you'll know that I've got a really handsome multi-stem version in the other part of the Exploding Atom Garden. But this one's a relative baby. It's probably about three years old. So this medlar has been grafted onto a quince rootstock, which means it's going to control its ultimate height and growth. And this one's going to get to about three and a half metres by probably two metres in width. Now, you may be thinking, gosh, that's big. But actually, in terms of trees, it's not that large. And if you have a look here, you'll notice the nursery that I got it from has really cleverly pruned it to make sure that it's got a really clear, clean main stem and then all of these offshoots that are sort of spaced really evenly. And if you follow my other guides on pruning trees and shrubs, you'll know that the open goblet form is kind of the classic for a healthy tree or shrub. So we've already got this kind of open goblet form going on. So even if you've only got a tiny garden, a three and a half metre tree is by no means massive it's not going to take over and if you pick the right root stock like a quince or maybe one of the smaller root stocks you can grow these in containers or in even small urban spaces so i'm going to put it in here it's going to get to about three and a half to four meters in about maybe five to ten years 
but it's going to help define this space and also provide some interest with these really weird fruits. So as I mentioned, this is a bare root, which means that it's lifted when it's dormant in the winter. And the beauty of bare roots are the more cost effective, the easier to ship, and you've got a greater variety. So you can pick really wonderful trees like this medlar. Now I've soaked it overnight, just in a bucket of water to rehydrate the roots. But you don't really want to leave them longer than a couple of days before you get them in the ground. Because if they dry out, chances are they're going to die. Because although they're dormant, they're still using small amounts of energy and needing small amounts of moisture to keep themselves transpiring. So soak them overnight, dig a hole and then get them in. So I want to dig roughly a hole one and a half times the width of that. So although we've got all this ground here, ignore that because that was where the evergreen oak went. So really I want to be digging sort of that size hole and I only want to bury it to the graft. And I'm going to show you that now. So the easiest way to tell where the graft is, is to look for the bulge, bump or knobble where the rootstock joins the main tree. And you can usually see, if you look up close, either the actual texture will change or the angle slightly and it will look a bit knobbly. And that's the graft there on this one. So I want to bury it just below there. And you can see where it's been in the, in the plastic bag when it's been damp. So this is kind of the level I want to bury it. So I've dug my hole, I've got my medlar here. I'm just going to check it fits. So I want to bury it just below the graft. And a good way to check is to use your spade on the flat and butt it up. If it's at the right height, then you know you're deep enough. If this is too high, it needs to go lower. If that's too low, it needs to go higher. And then start to scoop in a bit of soil. I don't put it all in at once because I need to stand back and make sure that it's actually level. So put a bit in. You might want to get a friend to help if you find it a bit difficult, but okay. Let's just check, is that looking about right? Stand back. Yeah, and so I'm looking for this to be level. So if you've got a graph like mine that's a bit wonky donkey, bit of a loop there. Don't plant it so that the bottom is directly straight. You want it so that the top half of the tree, the main part, is vertical. You don't really want it at an angle because the wind will then pick it up. It's going to look a bit odd and it'll start to grow up anyway. So in a straight line as best you can. And then you just heel it in. And what that means is using your heel to basically firm up around the tree. Now, it's really muddy and wet at the moment, so this is a bit of a, a bit of a mess. But as long as it's healed in properly, then it, it will be fine. So the next thing we need to do with any new tree is to stake it. And you do that with a wooden stake. And the reason why we stake newly planted trees is to protect them from exposure and wind. Because as they get battered in some of the harsher months, they have a tendency to rock, which can uplift the roots, therefore damage or kill the tree or mean that it finally settles in a really awkward, like bendy-wendy position, which we don't want. So for the first couple of years, we need to support it to make sure that it has a little bit of movement, but not so much that we're going to damage the roots or injure the tree. So my top tip with tree stakes is to stake them towards the exposure. And what I mean is that in this position, the wind primarily comes from over there, that direction. So it's gonna hit this tree and push it that way. It very rarely comes in from this direction. So I want the stake against the exposure. Because what that will do is it will push the tree away from the stake, not towards it. If I put it on this side and tie it, and then the wind starts to push, it's going to bash the tree against the stake. And what that will do is damage the trunk, damage the branches, and injure the tree. So, top tip, always away from the exposure. If you're exposed around all sides and all angles, which is quite rare, what you can do is use two upright stakes, one at each side, and double tie it. Now I tend to use one of these stake drivers here, which are really heavy. I'm just going to give it a few whacks to get it in. Oh, 
So now the tree's in and I've got the stake in place, I'm going to water it. And you can be a bit savvy, because if you've had your bare root in a bucket overnight like me, you might as well reuse the water. There's no point getting clean. So I'm just going to pour that round and let it sink in. Now, even if it's been thoroughly wet, like it has been here at Garden Ninja HQ, you always need to water in new plants. It doesn't matter what the weather's like, whether it's going to rain today or tomorrow, give them a good water. Okay, so time to get the tree tied, tie it in, jobs are good in. Now with a tree tie, you want it so that it's secure enough to hold the tree, but not so tight that it asphyxiates it. And there are a number of different types of tie, but I'm going to use this one here because you can change the tension really quickly with this strapping. So at the moment, I'm literally not wanting to pull the tree towards the stake, but if the tree gets blown in the wind, from exposure that tie is just going to hold it so it can move a little bit wiggle wiggle but it's not going so that's tight enough for now as the tree grows as the main trunk gets thicker I can loosen it and in a few years I'll probably just remove it Now whilst you can prune a number of deciduous shrubs in winter, it's also important to do a little bit of research first to work out when they flower. If you've got spring flowering shrubs like this Forsythia or camellias, you don't want to prune them in winter until they flowered. If you prune them now, you're just going to cut off all these beautiful buds and then remove all of the flowers. And I've heard time and time again from people online saying that their partners, other halves or gardeners have come in and just strimmed them back in the dead of winter and they wonder why they never flower. So it's worthwhile checking when does my shrub flower. If it's an early spring flowering shrub, don't prune it until it's finished flowering. If it flowers in the middle of summer, the chances are you probably can get away with a bit of light pruning now. But if you do your research and check, you're not going to be disappointed by cutting off things that might flower in the next couple of weeks. Well, like I've just said, if we prune this now, we're going to cut off all of these gorgeous flowers. Whereas if we wait till April, we can prune it because it's finished flowering and that'll be fine. You can always inspect a shrub to see if it's about to flower. Now these ripe juicy buds are about to burst into a bright pink bloom. We wait until it's finished flowering. So if you're concerned, always prune after the shrub has flowered. And if you're not sure, do some research, take some photos. You could even go on the Garden Ninja forum and ask the Garden Ninja community what to do with that particular shrub. Now when it comes to pruning hydrangeas there are two schools of thought. There are those that tend to prune early, as in the end of February, beginning of March, and those that only prune in April after the last frost has passed. Now it really does depend on where you live in the country, how exposed you are, whether you're near the coast. For me, I tend to prune late February, early March. It's never harmed my hydrangeas, they're quite well protected and they always come back. If you are a bit more nervous or tentative, then prune in April. And if you want to know how to prune hydrangeas, make sure you check out, you've guessed it, my hydrangea pruning guide on YouTube. Also pop over to the forum where you'll be able to ask loads of questions about your exact type of hydrangea. So it's been a really busy month getting the exploding atom garden in shape, ready for spring. And we've had a bit of a weed a -thon. we've gone round and pretty much weeded the entire thing. And although it's a lot of effort, it's really worthwhile, because if we do it now, before the weeds start to pop up in the spring, we can keep on top of them. But you might notice that I've pretty much cut back all the herbaceous apart from the grasses. And if you've followed my video guides in years before, you'll know that I always leave them, because they just look beautiful. The time that I cut back ornamental grasses is now, the end of February. So when it comes to pruning ornamental grasses, I tend to use one of these. It's a Japanese scythe. Looks like an angry curved bread knife, but they're brilliant. Because what you want to do with any ornamental grass, anything that, that goes brown and crispy, is to cut it back pretty much to the base at the end of winter. And I'll leave them for winter because they look nice, they add structure. Birds and wildlife take up home with them and, and use the seeds and bits and bobs for nests. So it's worthwhile leaving them, but come the end of February, I get out my scythe and then I just slice down to the bottom and it might sound and look brutal but it's the best thing for them and they'll regenerate. If you leave them what you end up with is a really congested mess and no one wants a congested mess. Now 
So February is a really good time to start cleaning up and cutting back all of your herbaceous perennials. Now, if you're like me, I tend to lead them throughout the winter. I think it looks nicer, it's better for wildlife, and it's just a bit more relaxed. If you cut them back in early autumn, you're leaving barren ground all the way through the winter. There's not much for wildlife. Overwintering insects then have to find another home. It's not very good. However, the end of February is a prime time because that's when all the new growth is about to burst out. Now, I tend to use this Japanese scythe. It's a really good bit of kit to help cut through herbaceous perennials and all that crispy material with no drama. I also have a pair of secateurs. So if I'm cutting back things like salvias, I might be using this because the stems are quite thick. So if I use this, it's a bit brutal, this a bit more finesse. I'm gonna work around this raised bed in the granite garden and show you how I do that now. So come on, let's get pruning. Now, if you're a beginner, this may look really, really vicious, and it is, but with this gene, for example, if we don't prune it back, although there's a bit of green growth, it's all congested, and over the year, it's gonna look a real mess. It's not gonna be healthy or vigorous, so I'm gonna cut this all the way back with this side. And believe you me, in about a month's time, there's gonna be all this new growth. It's gonna look fantastic. You literally take it back to a couple of inches off the soil. There we go, look at all that. And all that can then be composted. Now, do you remember that last year we planted out some hyacinths that I'd had indoors It's kind of one of those supermarket displays that you get in spring. And look, I'll do a close up, it actually popped up. We've got about eight in here. It just shows the power of Mother Nature because you've had a brutal year. And usually these are forced and kind of like, almost like plant factories for displays and you don't really expect much of them. But if you've got bulbs and displays from inside or pots and containers, why not plant them out and give them a second and they survive? Have you got gardening questions that you need answers for? Well, why not head over to the Garden Ninja Forum on my blog, where you can ask me anything about gardens, plants, and garden design. There's a whole army of other garden ninjas there that can help provide answers to your questions. And it's a really great way to meet the other ninjas. So head over there now. So that brings us to the end of the February tour here at Garden Ninja HQ. I think you can see there's absolutely loads you can be doing in your gardens to set you up for success this year. If you've liked this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel where there are hundreds of garden design hints, tips and hacks to help you make your gardens awesome. If you've got comments, drop them below. If you've got really detailed questions about plants or garden design, head over to my website and look up the Garden Ninja Forum where there's hundreds of garden ninjas to help you answer your garden dramas. I've been Garden Ninja. Happy gardening.